I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city on earth. Bop, bop, boom. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the most haunted city on earth. My name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And I'm JT with stains on my shirt because I spilled coffee. Oh coffee stains. boy, coffee stains. Woo. It's okay. Ghostly coffee stains. Yes. Oh. Only uh, YouTube will be able to see that. But, yep. you know. <laughs> they will really If you're just me. listening at the podcast, he's covered in coffee. Coffee st- so From much head coffee. To toe coffee. <laughs> we dumped so much coffee on him. Uh, but yeah. um, other than JT's coffee stains, um, today we are going to be talking about the curse of the Poltergeist film series. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> 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 but. Um, before we get into that, though, um, we are so close to getting to 100 para junkies over on Patreon, and we have decided... By the time this actually... Hold on. By the time this airs, we might actually be past 100, so if they come and look... Okay. Just just a... All right. Just a well, disclaimer. Okay, yes. Disclaimer. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are front-loading some of our episodes, so... Yeah. Uh, we're, we're all going... Places. Well, we're going out of we're going out of town to shoot uh, pair junkie exclusives. Yep, in That's North Carolina, doing. we will finally talk about the moon eyed people. Moon eyed <laughs> people. The moon pie people are my favorite. Mm-hmm. I love moon pies. Moon pie oh my god. Yes, and and we'll be talking moon about pie. and we'll be talking about. Um, we're gonna we're gonna take the pair junkies um, to this really cool small cemetery that we on found. Yeah. on Bearwalla Mountain. It's right next to the mountain house. Um, it and, is so creepy. Oh yeah, and then. Finally, Helen's Bridge. Yes. Finally, Helen's Bridge. And we'll discuss too the uh, curse that I think is happening on Bearwall Mountain right now. Just well, we've we've discussed this. Oh, oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. I think the land spirits are very annoyed with Airbnb and oh, sure. uh, Verbo right now. It's a whole um, thing. Yeah, it's a whole thing. So, if you want to hear more about Bearwall Mountains land spirits being pissed mm-hmm. off. What? They can't hear. They can't oh, okay. hear. But it's just a bunch of clicking back there from the. It's also a dragging sound. Oh yeah. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Like in front of that uh, shiffer robe. I just like to say shiffer robe. Yeah, it's a fun shiffer word. Robe. The ghosts shiffer have robe. been very active um, in the space today. So you know they're they're. They're very... Uh, right, just ignore it. Okay. <laughs> just ignore it. We are a ghost podcast. <laughs> like, yeah. Ignore the ghost. Let's just <laughs> let's talk about this movie. But anyways, so um, yeah. So if you want to hear more about that or you want to see those episodes, make sure to join us over on Patreon. But yeah. anywho, getting into the curse. The curse. The curse. It's really bizarre, y'all. Like, um, There's so many really strange occurrences around the Poltergeist movies um, and... Uh, yeah, it's just bizarre because I think the first time that it was ever brought up to me uh, was before uh, even uh, before Carol Ann passed. Right. Away. Well, uh, people were still were talking about it that early on. Right. They were they were literally like, "Oh, did you know that this happened? Did you know that this happened?" Right. Because the big one. Oh well, I'm I'm, oh, yeah. I'm jumping ahead. So okay. Let's, let's, so hold on, if you guys. Have not seen any of the Poltergeist movies because the curse kind of extends all throughout the like series it does, of the franchise. Um, but to kind of give you a lowdown on like what the first movie really is about, um, the film was released in 1982. Uh, it was directed by Toby Hooper, and um, it was uh, produced by Steven Spielberg. So. Big big time movie. If you haven't seen it, where have you been? Um, so. Yeah, it is. It is. It is one of the best. Supernatural. Oh, absolutely! Uh, movies out there. And I close the doors because they're here. They're here. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, it was an, in- an instant success, and it was considered a masterpiece in American horror cinema. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah. 
It, it really is. It's so well done. It's on, it's on yeah. the level of masterpiece, like uh, with The Exorcist, in oh, my opinion. Yeah. It was it's not as scary as The Exorcist, obviously, but it's it's, it's up fun, there. Though. Well, it was so fully produced. Oh, was yeah. the thing. You know, it, it had a heightened sense of production that yeah, you just did. you didn't see before in. Um, in horror movies and supernatural horror movies, you know, uh, because uh, before that you, you would get these movies, even The Exorcist was was contained and uh, they did some amazing effects, but they pulled out the stops with they the did. Poltergeist they did. and there's a, um, mm-hmm. because ghost stories of that era, of that period were very muted and partly like the ghost story or mm-hmm. changeling or, you know, these, you know, Almost dramas is like yeah. very close up look at a person's face while he hears a distant sound. Right. What is that distant sound? But this was like in your face. <laughs> You're like, oh no, <laughs> was not prepared. Ooh, and also just side note, um, before we get into this, uh, if you like The Exorcist, go ahead and watch a movie that oh, recently yeah. came out called The Exorcism of God. The oh yeah, yeah. you yeah. seen it? You oh, saw it? Yeah. It's so, so good. good. Right? It's so good. It's very Yo. good. Yeah. yeah. Excellent! It, one of the <sighs> best exorcism movies I've seen come out in a long, long and there is time. A, uh, an exorcism movie coming out in theaters, uh, The Pope's Exorcist. Yeah, Ooh. which is based on true accounts. Not a sponsor, but I wish they were. Yeah. <laughs> so if you, but the reason why I say if you like The Exorcist, that director was heavily influenced by The Exorcist, oh, and yeah. you can yeah, tell. Yeah, oh, you can it. definitely tell yeah. from the first, from, from the, like the very first, beginning. Yeah, from the very beginning. You know, I did a little bit of research on that. It was actually only made for like 1.2 million, which wow. I mean, the the amount of production was unbelievable for that. So they stretched that. They shot it in Mexico and Venezuela. Yeah. Um, and it was just, it was just unbelievable. I mean, just the, like, it was really fun. And I loved all of the, like, they focused heavily on, you know, the religious imagery, uh, which made it even scarier, especially mm-hmm. if you are a religious person. So it was, it was oh, yeah. a dope film. Um, so, not a sponsor, but wish they were. Right. Um, so... Diving back into the synopsis, essentially. Um, So the film focuses on the Freelings who have a home in California that starts to become plagued with a number of paranormal and uh, aggressive type uh, ghostly activity. And their daughter, Carol Ann, is abducted through her bedroom closet by a group of ghosts who are under the control of a monster demon called the Beast. The Beast. So... Um, that's the gist of what you need to know. Basically, Absolutely. if you haven't seen the uh, Poulter guys, go watch it. It's yeah. so good. And they really touch upon so many amazing, uh, um, paranormal investigatory tropes. Oh yeah. You know, um, and, uh, and there's even a character that was modeled after Lorraine Warren. Yeah. In the, oh, in the that's movie. Right. Yep, uh, yep, and yep. famously, everyone knows the you know go to the light, Caroline. She's got that yeah, really weird southern yeah. accent. <laughs> um, uh, but there's there's a lot of uh, amazing research that went into it because it was just com- putting story upon story upon story, all of which we've heard and became very trope. You know, houses built on mm-hmm. uh, cemeteries, Native, Native yep. American land, blah blah blah. So many of them that you're just like, wow. They 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 really congealed Everything. so many Why? stories mm-hmm. into this, and it was it was kind of um, yeah, I even I want to say for the thirtieth anniversary they were making a documentary, and there's talk about Savannah mm-hmm. in there, mm-hmm. uh, formerly Calhoun Square, being you know a bunch of houses that they believed were built on top of graves. Sure. Right. You know, and so that whole story, they were like, you know, this is a common story. You know, this is, this is the kind of story that, you know, Toby Hooper sought out that, you know, so yeah. So, um, the curse basically, uh, it was the majority of it was fueled with, you know, um, the idea that there was a curse bestowed upon the cast and because of things that would happen on the set, uh, but there were multiple deaths of cast members, and total four cast members would die, and we'll go into each of their deaths. But yeah. um, two of these deaths, though, were very unexpected yes. and very confusing, um, which made fans really start to go down this rabbit hole of um, this kind of conspiracy theory of a curse. Um, the first death would be... Um, Heather O'Rourke. Mm. Rook is O'Rourke? O'Rourke. I O'Rourke. O'Rourke. Um, well, she played 
Carol Ann uh, Freeling, who is obviously the focal point of the series. And she was only six years old when the first Poltergeist film was um, released. So uh, she was di- misdiagnosed with Crohn's disease in 1987. Uh, but the following year, O'Rook uh, fell ill again, and her symptoms were kind of just dismissed as being the flu. And so they let her go on. But uh, a day later, she collapsed and suffered cardiac arrest. A little Wow, a little girl. She was 12 years old. Oh, poor thing. And, um, and it was during the filming of the third Poltergeist yep. movie. Yeah. I mean, they literally finished the movie post her death. So wow. there were there were stand-ins and doubles and you know things like that. Exactly, and so after she was airlifted um, to a children a children's hospital in San Diego, uh, she died during an operation to correct a bowel obstruction, and it was later believed that she had been suffering from a congenital intestinal abnor- abnormality. Mm. So, again, very bizarre because those are not typically things that you see in a twelve-year-old girl. No. Um, and so that was just one of the first really weird well, deaths. So, so bizarrely, um, in the first movie, if you if you watch the first movie, there's an older sister. Mm-hmm. She was not in the second movie or the third movie yep. because she was brutally murdered. Yes, she was. Yeah, after the first movie, so she was she was technically the first death among the uh, the cast that they talk about because I want to say there's some crew members that they talk about. Yeah, but uh, I I distinctly recall she was like. Strangled by her boyfriend? Is, yes, is that actually. <laughs> we, we can talk about that now. All right. Uh, Dominique Dunn. Yep. Um, now, uh, Dominique Dunn, like Chris said, uh, played the older sister, Dana Freeling, um, and she would die in 1982, so literally wow. right yep. after. Literally, the, yeah, like uh, after the premiere. You know, yeah. Like, <laughs> um, so Dunn had recently separated from her uh, boyfriend, John Sweeney, and in November of that year, she, he showed up at her house pleading for her to take him back. Well, uh, she refused, and Sweeney grabbed Dunn's neck, choked her until she was unconscious, and left her to die in her Hollywood Holmes driveway. Mm-hmm. And Sweeney was sentenced to six and a half years in prison. But Wait, was, what? Yeah. Six and a half? Yeah, and he was released after three years and seven months. For a murder? Yeah. In ca- wh- what? Yes. Doesn't California have like the death penalty and stuff? Mm, no. Not at that time. I, th- I think no? a lot of it had this after 76, which is when it was federally Yeah, but I think reinstated. Well, you got to remember it, it yeah. was oh. you got to remember it's the 80s. There it was a lot harder to pin a murder without any kind of witnesses or, you know, things like that. So I mean, it sounds well, like we know what happened. Right. That he left her alive. It was probably his conceit that he thought that she was fine, you know, so it, it would probably become involuntary manslaughter or, you know, an accident. <laughs> not, not, not in Florida or Georgia. No. no. <laughs> that boy would be gone. Florida or Georgia, you, you could have hunted him down in the streets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. But the yeah. police would have given you a high five. <laughs> so that was the other um, death particularly Jeez. that was just really well, and bizarre. It kind of sparked the whole curse right because like i said before um before the third poltergeist movie there was already talk of the curse you know there was already talk of isn't it weird that these people died mm-hmm. you know these cast members died and and you know so many issues came up with producing the show um it, least, it's excuse me. wild and um there were actually two other cast members who would die um now, these deaths, I will say, they were not as mysterious no. or unexpected, um, and, but they were still unfortunate, so don't, don't get me wrong. They, it's still very sad that they passed, but it's not as like, shocking as a 12-year-old girl dying from no. cardiac arrest, Yes, basically. Right. Um, so one of those people would be the preacher, uh, Kane, the evil preacher, Kane, from uh, Poltergeist 2, who is played by Julian Beck. Um, in 1983, Beck had been diagnosed with stomach cancer, which he ended up passing away from soon after he finished work on the second installment of the series. And then the um, other person who would pass away also died from um, after the second film, which was Will Sampson, right. who played uh, Taylor, the Native American shaman. And he died after mm-hmm. undergoing a heart-lung transplant 
uh, heart and lung transplant, which had been very, uh, had a very slim survival rate. Right. Mm. Uh, but interestingly with Samson, I will note the weir- the thing that made his death even weirder was because right after um, the uh, second film had wrapped, Will Samson actually performed an authentic exorcism literally right after the film wow. wrapped. So, what? and then he died. So that was kind Whoa. of like what made his death particularly really freaking weird. Whoa. Yeah. Now, there are some other weird things that would happen yep. on set uh, that okay. weren't exactly uh, death related. Death related, yeah. But uh, basically, Joe Beth Williams, who played the mom, um, she claimed that in the first two films that uh, – Steven Spielberg insisted on using actual human skeletons as props. Did he really? Yeah. So, <laughs> in an attempt to save money because they were cheaper. Say, they were cheaper. Uh, it is common practice if you see a, a skeleton in yeah. in like uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s movies, they were skeletons. They were, you know, human skeletons, human remains because they these are things that, you know, uh, it was more expensive to make and cast and and have a, a fake skeleton than it was to have, you know, to take from the prop yeah, but that's, closet. That's like a desecration. Well, so, what's even weirder is because the scene in question is uh, she falls at the swimming pool and there are all these bodies. Yeah. Those are skeletons that they also reattached flesh to. <laughs> they, that they, you know, they, they, they hung, you know, uh, vestiges yeah. of life. Oh, yeah. And those were like real, like yeah, those were real people, people. yeah, <laughs> skeletons. And and uh, Joe Beth says she she mm-hmm. did not know that until after that scene had been shot. She didn't right. know that she was in a pool full of of actual human remains. So so there's like no consent there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I about think putting someone in a pool with human remains, whenever, and then they're desecrating hum, humans. Whenever you are a right. skeleton, you you are donating your 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 remains to become a study aid, you know, you, to become something. So, yeah, there is consent because you sign off. You, you, they don't just take bodies and say, let's turn this into a skeleton. You, you have donated your body to, okay. to that. But, like, no, specifically yeah, I mean, to still, be shown in a horror film? Well, it, well, because these skeletons end up in property, you know, in, in prop yeah. warehouses and, and, and things of that nature after being used yeah, in universities and things like that. So That's disturbing. It, it is disturbing. That's disturbing. So, yeah. Um, that's one of the reasons why some people think that the curse was really a thing. I don't think it's necessarily that, that even though that is very dark and very macabre. But, mm-hmm. you know, um, I don't know what exactly would have spurred the curse but I don't know. Maybe they were using human remains. <laughs> well, I don't think that. Yeah, but that I, was in like the second film or whatever. No, that was yeah. the first film. Oh, remember she goes into one. that pool oh, in the very first yeah. film. Yeah. But um, but that I was pretty it. common practice in horror movies. Um, they weren't using rubber skeletons. They weren't using you know. It was not uncommon. Uh, when you deal with volumes, when you have like yeah. a big gigantic stack mm-hmm. of them, like if it's a single skeleton, there's there's probably a good chance that you're looking at you know a rubber or or sure, plaster. Sure. Um, however. Uh, it does kind of shine the light on awareness mm-hmm. on uh, uh, groups of people paying attention to a story that you're telling and that story being very closely related to events and things and ideas. Uh, I think, I'm pretty sure we've said this before. There is, um, there's a notion of which came first, the ghost or the ghost story. If you get a bunch of people on board to create a story and that story is very closely aligned to things that people believe and you're altering people's understanding mm-hmm. of how the paranormal works and you've got crew members and you've got cast members and they're all now being introduced to the ideas of ghosts and the ideas of how ghosts might go on and how things might happen and, and you're doing due diligent work mm-hmm. to find stories that people tell and legends that people uphold and things like that, all of a sudden you are cementing uh, a ghost story. And so when you get a bunch of people together and you have them like really dedicated to that idea, because I think you'll hear this with numerous stories, like even The Exorcist has stories about, you know, cast members and, and people mm-hmm. on set having instances and because they have delved into something that either was new to them or at the very least that they concentrated very hard on. Um, we, we talk about intent all the time. 
Yeah. And when you deal with intent, you when you start to really think about what does that mean when you get mm-hmm. hundreds of people involved in telling a single ghost story, you kind of condense it all into this notion that there's sure. a demon chasing you. That there's, right. you know, and that in a way works the way that seances work and works the way that the Ouija board works and works the way you, you, you brought a bunch of people to, to collectively think about this scary system and the scary series. And, and maybe there's a door that opens there. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's a thing that goes there. And I, I do not put it past because I don't, I don't have any reports of it. I don't know that it happened, but I would not put it past people involved in it getting involved in Ouija and getting involved in seances and doing these things as a part of their artistic preparatory you know, right. atmosphere. I'm going to just say that I think it's the remains. I don't know. I think I it's know. the remains. That's that's a lot of... You, those people are not giving consent to be in a film. <laughs> that's a, I mean, okay, sure, to like teach people about bones, but like... But, like, that's way different than being in a paranormal horror film. I mean, you know, I'm a filmmaker myself. I just would not, I wouldn't use real, real yeah, people. Yeah, that's fair. I wouldn't I do mean, it. That, that's, and, right. and a lot of people do think that that is, that is the key. Gotta have to the budget. It. It's just you know? one of those things that, because it, of commonality, we, we make it sound, oh, terrifying. Yeah. It, it, being a common practice and being something that probably was not, you know, because people think that, you know, they went down to the graveyard and they, they yeah, pulled bodies right. out and threw them in the pool. No, these were prop skeletons. They just happened to be formerly human. Imagine you know, how haunted things. those warehouses must be. Oh, yes, be, you absolutely. Know, it's it's uh, so peculiar. Well, and that's another thing because um, when I was, uh, I went to massage therapy school. And when we were in massage therapy school, we had to um, learn muscles and, and how they work. And there's a whole line of videos where they had cadavers. Uh-huh. And they literally Sorry. peeled them apart and muscle by muscle showed how the muscles work, where they, you know, inserted and, and all these things. And I couldn't help but wonder, you know, uh, you donate your body and then you're on display as mm-hmm. a corpse. And then they're peeling you layer by layer mm-hmm. to show all these things. And it's like, there's something so, there was a very visceral response to the idea that that's a person. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, or have you ever seen the bodies exhibit? Um, the bodies exhibit. So the bodies exhibit is an exhibit. Uh, I think it originated in China, but it's basically uh, human beings. They, these are all human oh, beings, yeah. and mm-hmm. they're peeled. And they're you know you, you saw see something them like that in Edinburgh. Yeah, the Surgeons Museum by yeah. layer by layer down to you know they, they'll have the entire nervous system. You know, sure. Up, and it's like that was a human being. I'm what I'm yeah. looking at. And that's that sounds that sounds good. That sounds normal. <laughs> that sounds that normal. That sounds normal. <laughs> Using a body for a movie does not sound normal. Those people are on display in museums. Yeah. They're, they are not. They uh, do. You know. that's, that's, that's informational versus entertainment. Oh, and they're Your prisoners. Your death is entertainment. <laughs> they were prisoners. They were prisoners. Yes. Okay. Most of those bodies were prisoners. The, um, okay. <laughs> wait, the, wait, in the movie or the? No, no. Okay, in the, in, okay, gotcha. uh, uh, in the, bodies. the bodies. Okay, gotcha. And the Surgeon's Museum that JT's referring to is in Edinburgh. It's a horrific museum, <laughs> like very unassumingly horrifying museum. Mm-hmm. We went there to see the um, uh, Burke and Hare Oh, stuff because right. yeah, they have the real stuff. Wow. Yeah, they they have um, the book bound in human skin. Um, and then, uh, if you go to the National Scotland Museum, then they had the Birkin hair dolls, which is very fascinating. But regardless, um, JT was so freaked out um, by this museum because they literally, from floor to ceiling, have jars of tumors oh, yeah. and brains yeah. and yeah. Um, just you don't wanna, yeah, there's things we shouldn't look things. at. Right. Horrific yeah, unless you're things. a medical professional, I, I don't want to see these things. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like there's literally a cancer room. I yeah, kid you not. There's a cancer room. There was. There was a cancer room and they're like, this is all the cancer that's been cut out of people. And I'm like, okay. And <laughs> you know, that's the type of stuff that I'm like, there is no way there's not some hauntings in this building. Oh, yeah. Think, from, you know, yeah. uh, those bits of people that are just preserved um, and put yeah. out on display. Same kind of concept. No, you know? no for sure. But, yeah, for sure, it's, for sure. Um, back to the poltergeist. So, uh-huh. Back um, to the poltergeist. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that all of this would happen to mostly the family members mm-hmm. of sorts, which is intriguing because they're the focal points they could have maybe by whatever entities that are 
if you're going on the theory that an entity might have been brought out through the process of these filmings and whatnot, if it might have attacked the family members because they were the core focus of the films. Because that's how the story goes. Exactly. Because the story was these people were living in the house and they are the haunted. Right. And to include um, uh, the two that weren't family members, uh, one was the perpetrator. Right. He was the uh, he was like a cult leader, the character, uh, and the other was the um, one fighting, you know, uh, protecting. So you know they were locked in in combat, and those two died. The two that were representing mm. the good and the evil of the story, both passed very close to each other too, like time wise. They did, which is so strange. That is Not so abnormal strange. because the preacher man, I think he was cast because he looked like a walking corpse. Mm-hmm. You know, he yeah. looked very skeletal and very, you know, sure. and, and he was very old. So, you know, hearing that he had passed was not like, but he was so young. It was like, no, yeah. I, I absolutely understand that. Um, but still, when you take into consideration the whole picture. Right. Know? It's just weird occurrence after weird occurrence. And, you know, it, it makes you wonder, um, you know, even like like you were saying, if they had some of the crew members or cast members might have been dabbling into various other occult things, or very at least entertaining it, entertaining those ideas, sitting there and and you know uh, on your coffee break being like, mm-hmm. hey, have you ever done? Oh, you know, well, I'm interested. You know, just that chatter, you know, of of, of trying to create a realistic uh, because some of the things that they showed in that movie, um, spoiler alert. Uh, there is a scene in which a man goes into the bathroom and he starts mm-hmm. picking at his face. The ensuing scene was one of the most visceral things I'd seen. In, in I was young. I was 10, I think, when I saw it. And it, it, was, it damaged me. It was it's yep. a damaging scene. I was like, this is PG? <laughs> this was it really PG? Yeah. Yeah, it's a PG no film. No wonder my parents were like, yeah, you can watch well, that. Well, that's just it. It's, it, was, it was definitely one of those things because it had a lot of comedy to it. Yeah. it, it there was kind of a lighthearted, it, there was a, a, a heroic end to it all yeah. in a way. Joss was PG. Um, yeah, that can't be true. That's true. That's <laughs> I, insane. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't feel right. Yep. Uh, motion Picture uh, uh, Academy, or no, uh, Motion Picture Whatever. The MPAA. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I remember going to Blockbuster and I'm like, I want this one. And then and my parents were like, okay. Oh, and, and it was just. I don't like so- clowns. I don't like dolls. I don't like clown dolls. I know. Oh. I, I figured. <laughs> I figured that's uh, down at the bottom. What? Yeah, I believe it's because it didn't have PG 13, so they, it wasn't R. Oh. So they're like, well, if it's not R, it's PG. Oof. That's crazy. Mm-hmm. I would never have, have, have guessed that because there are some truly gruesome things there in that movie. There are such gruesome things. Yes. And there's nudity. Yes. Well, yeah. at the beginning is naked. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, she is, isn't she? Back, mm-hmm. there was a time, hard. I guess, when PG included <laughs> nudity. I guess so. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's also intriguing that this film would come out during kind of the height of the occult movement, the yeah. Satanism oh, yeah. the, movement. The satanic panic. Absolutely. Yeah, and I wonder if a part of that didn't have, you know, sure. some uh, well, elements of it. One of the interesting things about it is because it stood as a almost propaganda for fighting evil. You know, <laughs> propaganda. Right. Uh, he's saying, there are evil spirits. There are the demon and fight the demon. Uh, it's not nearly as glorifying as 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 people would assume mm-hmm. uh, these movies could be or influential in that sense. Sure. Um, because in the end, I think you wanted to be the heroes mm-hmm. of that story, Um which we kind of lost in a lot of horror movies for a long time. Uh, is, and the 80s was, was, was very bad at this. They, were, uh, they became more and more villain-centric because mm-hmm. uh, there was a time when horror movies were about the survivors and then they became about the killers. You know, uh, all of a sudden, your Jason Voorhees, your Michael Myers, your Freddy Kruegers, yep. they were the, the reason you went. You went for, to watch the killers and how cleverly they kill. Or, you know, how, yeah. and, and, and you didn't care if no. they were beaten. Uh, and generally, you, you you would be disappointed if they're beaten because then that means there's not a you know Nightmare on Elm Street six, um, <laughs> and that becomes like a, an interesting thing. Was uh, this was right at that the iceberg tip? 
Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And uh, and Toby Hooper, of course, famous for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yep. Which yeah. you know he came on the scene with one of the most viscerally disturbing movies of mm-hmm. of the time, uh, and possibly of all time. You know, there are moments in that movie that you can't shake. And then he came on to Poltergeist, which was kind of a family, you know, romp, really. I mean, yeah. Certainly by comparison. Well, wow. <laughs> that tree, that tree is horrifying. Yeah, the tree, tree is horrifying. Great. Yeah. Tree was great. The tree was <laughs> what, horrifying. What else happened on set? Was there anything else that creepy that happened on set or was that it? I mean, that was about what I found. Oh, okay. So, okay, gotcha, so. gotcha. So I can remember stories about like having power issues, uh, you know, just, just those, those classic, um, sure. you know, crew members reporting strange things occurring, things right. moving, things not being where they left them, you know, stuff okay. like that, which becomes kind of classically the kind of stories that, that propagate when you have a ghost, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, this is haunted. Oh, well, you know, I heard, you know, so-and-so I, I heard that, you know, they, they had a crane that got stuck and, and it, it hit a, a live wire or something, blah, blah, blah. So you do hear a lot of stories, but, but the irrefutable ones, are these four deaths? Right, the four deaths. Yeah, in a relatively short span of time, between uh, in a six-year period of time, uh, major cast members of this franchise died, and, and and the weirdest one being the focal cast member, yeah. right. being a six-year-old child. The focal cast member dies, telling stories about ghosts and telling stories yeah. about. And, and and you have to wonder how uh, her career, what her career path would have been. Right. Because she was basically a Drew Barrymore mm-hmm. uh, shoulder to shoulder. I want to say that. Um, yeah, like E.T. Like that. Yeah. Well, Drew Barrymore and, and the E.T. Yeah. I think Drew Barrymore was might have been younger. Uh, but. She was a baby scream queen. She was so. a baby scream queen. Because yeah. I, I want to say, she, wasn't she in another horror film? Who? The, the little girl. Oh. Mm-hmm. In that period? Thinking wrong? No. Uh, I'm going to look it up. Yeah, yeah look it up. The computer. The, uh, Pocket computer. Well, also another side interesting note to make about this. Interesting choice in calling it poltergeist because right. everything they <laughs> show not. is literally the exact opposite of what a poltergeist is. Right, which led to... Wait, really? I thought it... That, I thought a poltergeist was an evil entity. No, it's a noisy mm. ghost. Noisy ghost. It's a noisy ghost. ghost. That's yeah. literally what it means. So, so what? Yes. No. Yes. So whatever's in the room's a poltergeist? Uh, I mean, we're hearing it. Yeah, possibly. 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 Uh, Usually it's without intent. It's the the thing that goes bump in the night. Oh, so, so, okay. Does, then I got a question for something to be a poltergeist. What if it like, you know, knocks a, a glass, a mason jar off the, off the counter. Is that a poltergeist? Well, it doesn't have to scree, but I mean like, it can be. It's so. Poltergeist are spirits that predominantly just cause noise. Like they are the ones that are opening and closing your cabinets no. and they're the ones that are knocking things off consistently or they're knocking on walls, they're stomping on floors, okay. whatever. Um, that is not to say that everything that knocks something off your table yeah. is a poltergeist because that's some ghosts, that's their... First way of trying to communicate is knocking something over because it's an easier way to communicate. Okay. okay. Um, yes. But it doesn't necessarily mean immediately. Oh, poltergeist. You know. Right. Usually, you would uh, you, you would affix poltergeist activity to annoyance. You know, yeah. <laughs> something that annoys you. You know, something that 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 unexplainable, annoying. Um, once it starts moving into intelligent territory, it moves away from being a poltergeist uh, by definition. Once, once you start getting entities, once you start seeing it, because mm-hmm. that's a big thing is you generally don't see a poltergeist. Poltergeist, you know, open cabinets and mm-hmm. move things. And, you know, okay. you hear things crunch and, and, and stuff like that. It's just, and some people would say it's just energy, like a wave of energy that, that rolls through and, and disrupts things. Right. All right. So, so basically... What are y'all's opinions on the curse? Uh, like, like because if it is a curse, well, then it's like a very, very violent curse. I mean, mm-hmm. you're, you're talking about something that murdered four people. Um, so what what do y'all think? Do you think it's just happenstance? Or do you think just as, as like, as pros, what do you think? It's tricky. I mean, 
I'm not going to negate, in, and I am definitely not the person to s- sit here on my high horse and be like, there's no curse. But, you know, it's, um, I, I don't lean towards curse. I Because all of these deaths, even though it's really bizarre that they would all happen in this six-year period, can still be explained because, yeah. you know, um, the older sister, she had a, a boyfriend she was trying to get rid of. Obviously, there was some type of volatile relationship there. It's not. It's unfortunate, but it's not out of the ordinary that sometimes yeah. people are like, if I can't have you, no one can have you, basically. <laughs> right. And then with the little girl, even though it's very rare for a child to die in that way, she had a history of chronic illness. Right. Beforehand. If it, beforehand, right. because yeah. they had misdiagnosed her with Crohn's disease, which means that she had something else that was going on, clearly, sure. but they just didn't properly diagnose her. And that is probably because she was a six-year-old child. And, right, you, know, you wouldn't expect you know, yeah. that kind you of... Know, that t- those types of problems in a child of that nature. And sure. we, we don't know her whole medical history. And then the two later ones, like I said at the beginning, though they are sad... They are both not unexpected right? because yeah. the heart and tr- lung transplant, th- that already had a very slim survival right. rate. And then okay. the other guy, he was, cancer, he that, had cancer. You know. So, I mean, it's not. Okay. So it's, 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 so it's probably not it's a, curse. a it's retroactive a, curse. Right. Meaning when you compile it together and you look at it, you can claim the curse as a series of very bad events that all seem to, to be around the production of this series of films. Um, And that, in a way, is just coming up with a word for the the, the level of misfortune that fell upon the the group of of creators that made these movies. I think people just want to continue the horror. They they, they love the movie and all of that, and then then calling it a curse is... Yeah, (laughs) yeah, but... But I think for a lot of people, calling it a curse is probably pretty exciting. Yes, absolutely, yeah. and yeah. that's yeah, that's that's the thing. When you uh, hindsight, it's a it's a it's a curse when you're looking back at it as yeah. a, as as a package deal. Um, but I don't think it's because of of some ill intent or some sure. supernatural force. Um, but it is just weird. A very tightly knit series of unfortunate events. Well, and it's not the first movie to be called cursed. Oh, sure. What was not, that um, film that's called like the most cursed film? It's in the, the one that starts with an A. We yeah. brought we brought it up before. It's the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like anti. Oh, hold on, and it's something oh, like yeah, a nerve. And, I, mm, because I, it, it like mul- an eater. Like multiple <laughs> people died after seeing the movie, right? That something was, like that, that was the story. Know. But that's a separate episode. But I, 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 yeah. yeah, that that's worth a deep dive because I think it was uh, just good marketing. Right. Well, I'm still scared to watch it. I've never yeah. seen it because I'm like, Antrim. I'm not taking that Antrim. risk. Yeah. Yes. Oh, Antrim. Yeah. I'm not taking the risk of watching it, but, you but, know. But, you know, uh, the, uh, nothing will ever match uh, the Blair Witch Project's, mm-hmm. you know, brilliant uh, viral campaigning before virality was a thing right. you know uh um literally hiding the cast and and doing all these things uh building it up to be documentary yeah. you know yeah. found footage um and th- there is so much to be said about the engine surrounding trying to make a scary movie scarier by bringing it into your life by bringing it into your home and bringing it into you know uh the danger um which i think is probably where found footage really got its start was it looks like I I could be a part of it. You know, that this mm-hmm. could happen to me. Sure. You know, so when you do those those fake documentary style, there's one, um, Wolf Lake, which is uh, an Australian horror film. I think it's called Wolf Lake. Oh, which yeah. Is, which is no, just, no, no, um, no. Um, I know exactly what yeah. you're talking about. It's uh, we, uh, The Serial Killer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah, watched it. Yeah, we watched that. it. We watched yeah. it. Brilliantly done. Um, Not real. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but... As you're watching it, you have no no issue like giving sure. way because it was done very well. It was it was so well constructed that you're like, this feels real. This mm-hmm. this this has that sensibility because we've come to a place where we recognize documentary style. Mm-hmm. And so, if you can make something look documentary, 
you, you have you have room to really mess with people's brains. <laughs> oh yeah. It is very true. So I think the consensus is that Poltergeist is probably not cursed. Probably no, just no. It's just a, 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 a lot of, of terrible un- things. A series of unfortunate events. Yeah. I need to I need to do some more uh, uh, research on the the murder of that girl because I feel like six and a half years isn't enough. That's crazy, huh? It yeah. is crazy, and I like I said, there might be some something to the idea that she didn't die in his hands. You know, he caused her death. But it was not the intent to kill her. It was not the you know. Or they sucks could, to suck, bro. Or they you know, the, like, he had good lawyers who could, yeah really good lawyers yeah, yeah. you yeah, know so. so jeez yeah you, yeah you can do a deep dive into true crime, but it's you know in sentencing, so you know this you know it's yeah. um it, depending on how good your lawyer is, if you got a plea deal, you can like there's so many re- variables mm-hmm. of why you get certain amounts of time, and even if you did kill your girlfriend, but you know, it's yeah, the, it's the justice system. So uh, it's you true. Know. It's true. Um, Gotta love poltergeist. But it's how many poltergeist. are there? Uh, three, three, there's, and, and there's three. Well, Heather yeah. O'Rourke was only in three movies, yeah. and it was Poltergeist one, two, and three. No way. Yeah, yeah. she she made television appearances. She was in you know like an episode of Webster. Or, you know, she, sure. yeah. she was around, but um, as far as films, only only the three Poltergeist movies. Wow. Yeah, because she died right or during during the production of okay. the third one. The third one. So all right. So there you go. So go watch Poltergeist. It's a fun movie. It is a fun movie. You know, um, and now you know. And it has some pretty iconic scares. It does. And now you know about the human remains in the pool. So there you go. (laughs) When you see the skeletons pop up in the the pool. Just know. It's real. They're peoples. (laughs) Former uh, peoples. Former peoples. But thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Um, My name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And stay spooky, y'all.